In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the second part of the sermon I began last Sunday on the topic of the liturgical year. What is a liturgical year? And we saw last week, just as a brief recap for those who may have forgotten, it is, we said, something of an exteriorizing, an externalization of what is the church's thought, what is the church's sentiment of her divine spouse, our Lord. What does the church feel, if we want to even use that word, about her spouse? And we saw also how our purpose, our goal in life, is ultimately getting to heaven. That's our purpose for existence. That's the goal we have to achieve. That's what we're made for. And how it is impossible to get to heaven outside of our Lord. He himself says it in the, Holy, in the Gospel. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so... If that's our goal, and it's impossible to achieve that outside of our Lord, then we should be looking for what is the safest way for following our Lord. What is the safest course that we can take and thus save our souls? And that is to follow the church. And we saw also how a true appreciation, a true Respect, and we may say even a true understanding of what is the liturgy, develops and fosters a, the keenest following of our Lord because of that awareness. And we saw how the liturgy is not something that is a spectacle that we just sit back and watch like it was a movie that it was only about the question of rules and rubrics and gestures only. It is the great canticle, rather. It is the great song of love of our Lord for his Father. And how it is for us to follow and to unite ourselves to that prayer of our Lord, to unite ourselves to that song that he renders to his Father. And if we have that understanding, if we have that notion of what it is, of what the sacred liturgy is, then we, are, we should have a, ho a horror for the idea of improvising or inventing something. Take it from me as a priest... Almost every detail is regulated by the church in the liturgy because it pertains to this worship of God, which by nature is something social, it's something public. When you hear priests say, I will be saying a private mass, it means that the mass is not scheduled. He has the liberty to say mass at whatever time is convenient for him. But in reality, every Mass is public. It is social. It is not the priest's private devotion. He may be very devoted to saying Mass, that's true. But it is not on the same level as a private devotion that you may have. And therefore, no one is free to make up or fabricate liturgy. And so we see the wisdom of the church there. In this great mystery of our Lord, we see how maternal she is in our regard because she spaces things out for us. And in the liturgical year, she divides it into two cycles because she knows that we're weak and that we're easily distracted and we have, from time to time at least, the attention spans of fleas. She knows that we fall asleep when we would prefer not to. And she knows that we cannot think about too many things at the same time. 
And so she has divided this great mystery of our Lord into these two cycles. The first one, the main cycle, we may say, is what's called the temporal cycle. It is the one that is following the times of the year and focuses on the life of our Lord, primarily. And that begins with that first Sunday of Advent, which is just next time, one week from today. And we see already with that first Sunday of Advent coming up, we see how it is this preparation, this idea of preparation for the spiritual birth of our Lord at Christmas. And all of this season of Advent, a whopping four weeks, is this ascension towards the mystery of Christmas. Following that, we have what is called the Christmas season, which focuses on the holy childhood of our Lord and the holy family, and then goes into the time of the Epiphany. And after that, there is the tinge of sorrow with the beginning of the Lenten season, starting with Septuagesima Sunday, the 70 days before Easter, before Easter. And that goes all the way through to Holy Saturday. It's the long haul in the liturgical year. And after Holy Saturday, we have this ascension again. Well, rather, the Lenten season is the ascension towards this new life, this new life of grace after penance with the Feast of Easter. Then the Easter season, this time of having the bridegroom, the church rejoicing in having her bridegroom with her, now triumphant and no longer suffering, and we see that with having the Paschal candle in the sanctuary and how there are no fast days during the time of Easter. There's a vigil every now and then, yes, but there's no fast days during the time of Easter because of that. Our Lord's, again, His words from Scripture, when you have the bridegroom with you, you don't fast. That's the simple reason. And living in this spirit of faith that we our focal point in having the faith is the resurrection of our Lord. And after the end of it, at the end of this time, we have the Feast of the Ascension, when our Lord leaves, visibly shown by the Paschal candle being extinguished and removed. It's gone. It's not like the Novus Ordo where he stays in the sanctuary year-round. The church then mourns a little bit because her bridegroom is left and now she's waiting. She's waiting for the coming of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, which is living in that spirit of hope. And then from Pentecost onward, we have the Pentecost season. It's the time of fire. It's the time that is supposed to be going out. The faith is supposed to be going out into the world. That's why we use, for example, green vestments, because green indicates growth, increase. And with that season, we reach something of a peak, and we stay there, we rest there for many weeks. We stay on the mountain, as it were, guided by the Holy Ghost, and we contemplate. We contemplate the things that the church puts before us in that time. At all times, certainly, but particularly in that time. Because, again, it's a time of growth. How can we grow if we have nothing to feed off of? That's what the church gives to us. So that is the main cycle, and it focuses on the life of our Lord. And it's to stress that there is in the impossibility of being saved outside of our Lord. And so she's, the church tries to draw us as much as she can, using everything that she can to draw, make us love our Lord more. And the second cycle that she has is what's called the sanctoral cycle. And it's the system, the cycle of all the saints throughout the year. 
You could see in your missal, in the section that has the daily feasts, how more or less, at least once a month, there's a feast of Our Lady. We just had one yesterday. How there is more or less one or two apostles in a given month. And how all of the saints, how all of them are these models for us. They are the heroes that we look to. Because they have tried to follow our Lord. They have tried in their own particular paths, their particular vocations, followed our Lord. And they are for us guides if we get lost. If our focus is on the temporal cycle, following the life of our Lord, we, can, we might get lost. We think it's too high, it's too far, it's too something. So we look at the saints because they were human beings just like us. And each feast and season of the liturgy brings with it, offers to us a special grace. And as a result, our entire life, regardless of our state in life, should follow that of the liturgy. Pope St. Pius X says that the liturg a liturgical life is the authentic Christian life. And when we chew on that, we meditate on that, we see how true that is. We see influences in our daily life from the liturgy. It prescribes the way we eat, for example. There are the days of fasting and of abstinence. Every Friday of the year, exception of the Friday after Thanksgiving in America, it's without meat. We don't eat meat on those days. And why so? Because every Friday, Friday is honored by the church because of Good Friday, the death of our Lord. No servile work on Sundays and holy days of obligation. Because we are to give at least one day out of seven to God and the concerns of God. And that's not too much to ask. Even the location for building a church, the, de the ideal, the desire that the church has and when this is to take place, is that it should be in the center of the town, not on the outskirts. In the center of the town. Why? Because it is to be the focal point for the entire city. It's supposed to be the center of the entire life of the city. And how when the bells of the church ring, summoning, calling us to the worship of God, calling us to divine service, no one is left ignorant in the city of this occurrence, of this duty. It is this audible call that you have an obligation to render to God. It's not merely to, sound, have, to enjoy the tones that the bells make. Or also conforming our own private prayers to the rhythm of the church. There is the custom of using the relevant mysteries in the rosary as they correspond to the liturgical seasons. Saying, for example, the joyful mysteries for Advent and Christmas, the sorrowful during Lent, the glorious from Easter onwards until Advent. And that can be done privately or publicly. And we see also how we to form our own prayer life, we may say, by looking at the mind of the church and how she prescribes certain devotions for certain times. We are still in the month of November. It's dedicated to the holy souls. How the church, as it were, turns up the heat on the indulgences that we can gain for the holy souls during this month. 
or the custom of lighting, having and lighting the advent wreaths starting next Sunday, or during the octave of Corpus Christi in the spring, how Mass may be celebrated with the Blessed Sacrament exposed on the altar, or in May, the crowning of Our Lady, or in the month of October, that is devoted to the, the Holy Rosary, saying the Rosary publicly before the Blessed Sacrament exposed again. But if I stress nothing else, it is this idea of following this motherly wisdom, this motherly care of the church, and how she brings everything that she can to help us grow in this love of our Lord. And so how does this mother behave? How, how does she do that? She prepares everything to bring this mystery of our Lord to the forefront, to bring it to the minds of her children. The vestments, the lights, the candles, the incense, the chant, all of that is for the worship of God and how it is to form us in that same mind. And so we can say that family life, religious life, should be liturgical life. Such as times of penance that we take up or that we do times of penance. They should be in unity. They should be in step with the church's time. It would be absurd, for example, that we have 40 days of fasting in Easter because the bridegroom is there. The church is all about the joy of her bridegroom there with her after the resurrection. And we see again this danger of something of a Protestant mindset. This idea that I save my soul with my own devotions and my will and I don't need the church to tell me what to do. It's so dangerous. That's why we said at the beginning, the surest way of saving our souls is following the liturgy, which is to follow the church, which is to follow our Lord. So at the end of this current year, and soon to begin a new one, we should make an effort to follow the liturgy with Our Lady. Let her be your guide in this coming liturgical year. Follow the rhythm of the church. Follow the rhythm of the liturgy with Our Lady. Let her form you in this liturgical mindset, this liturgical spirit. And she will teach you. She will form you in this love and appreciation of the mystery that is her son. And if you rely on her to be your guide in that time, you can be sure of the fruits to be had. And you can be sure to be on the right path, to be on the right road for sanctifying your soul, sanctifying the souls of your family and your loved ones, and to growing closer to our Lord and growing in love of Him. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.